Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming and showing up. I will try to make this uh, as uh, fast and quick as possible. <laughs> I hope to keep you entertained and not having you sleep right here. Um, I was told that I had to talk about change and how changes can affect your life. And uh, I'm going to start with, you know, it would be easy to start where I was born in Atlanta in 1981, and then I wanted to be a student life manager, and that's how I got here. But that would be very easy. So let me go a little bit through the steps for this to happen. I was born in 1981 in Atlanta. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and, and uh, on June 5th, 1981. And then I grew up in a great, loving family. This is me right there. And I have my sisters, my mom and dad. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I, uh, I was raised in a great, loving family. And I'm going to skip a bunch of years to make this quicker. And I'm going to go all the way until uh, when I was 19 years old, okay? Sorry. <laughs> um, when I was 19 years old, I was here in Madrid. I, uh, Madrid and Spain, the legal age for drinking at that time was uh, 16. You could go out to clubs and drink and get all the drinks you wanted when you were 16. And let's just say I, I made some poor choices in, in my life, in my, in my young teenage years. I was, uh, partying a lot, I was going out too often, I was definitely not studying uh, as much as I should. Um, I ended up going through 12th grade twice because the first time was horrible and the second time wasn't a lot better, but I was able to pass on my second time. And um, when I was 19, a friend of mine after the summer, you know, a friend of mine made me open my eyes, he came to me and he said, Rodrigo, think about these past months. Think about what you have been doing with your life and think if this is really what you want with your life. And so I thought about it and looking back, I, all I could see was parties and more parties and I wasn't taking care of, you know, uh, being with my family or uh, my responsibilities. I wasn't doing anything other than just going out. Um, so I decided I needed a change. I needed a big change in my life. I decided that I had to move away. I had an American passport. I could speak the language. So I sent an email to all my aunts and uncles in the States saying, hey, will someone take me in uh, for a while until I find something? And uh, that's how I ended up in Tacoma, Washington, out of all places in the States. Uh, an aunt of mine and my aunt and uncle and my cousins, you know, they took me in. I was there for a while. I moved to the States in September 2000. By October, I already knew that, it, you know, I was serving tables at a restaurant already. I, I knew that with that money I was going to be able to pay for rent and buy a car, but I was not gonna be able to pay for college, which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to go through college and university. So on October 25th, just a month and a half after I had made it to the United States, I decided to join the US Army, okay? I joined the US Army Reserves. It was like a great deal. You do the training just like every other soldier does, four months or whatever your school takes, a very intense training. And then when you finish, you commit yourself to a week in the month and 15 days in the summer. So I could do this. I could continue serving tables. I could start going to college and get everything paid for. It was a very, very sweet deal. So the next year is when I did all my training. I went through basic training or boot camp. And then I went through military school. And it is hell. It is difficult. It is tough training. Um, by the time I got out of that, this was in... August 2001 and we all know what happened in September that year September 11th 2001 the Twin Towers New York I'm sure all of you remember what you were doing that day and I remember it just as well I was staying at a friend's house and uh, her roommates came back to the house in the morning they were supposed to take a flight from Seattle to New York but they were back in the apartment and they're like no all flights have been canceled something has happened so we turned on the TV and I saw this. Um, first thing I did was get on the phone and I called my captain. I said, Captain, I'm here, I'm ready. If you need me for anything, just give me a call and I'll be there. He said, you know, just, just let us know wherever you are at all times. Make sure that we can, you know, call you if we need you for anything and you'll be available. So that was fine. My second call was a lot tougher. I called my mom. I said, Mom, 
I'm going to war. And my mother, you know, she really couldn't understand. She's like, war? Already? Why? I said, well, mom, look, I still have like five more years of contract. There's going to be a war and I'm going to go into it. You know, it's going to happen. She couldn't speak. She couldn't answer back. She had like a knot in her throat. It was, it was very tough for her. She ended up hanging out the phone. I hung up and she was very distressed. And me, I was not. I was actually excited. I was, I had just gotten out of military training. I was very gung ho. I was ready to fight terrorism. I was pissed off. I was, you know, I was, I was just angry. It was a very angry, angry time for me. Um, those next couple of years, I did some col college, but you know, I was going through college and the army would call and say, you have a training mission or you have to come on operations to this other place. I traveled all over the United States doing different operations for the US Army. I was able to go to Japan a couple times in those years. And then in 2003, I finally got the call. Somebody calls and says, hey, we're activating a phantom unit, a ghost unit. A ghost unit, what it is, it's a unit that exists in name, but it has no soldiers in that unit. So what they say is, we're trying to put this unit together, 16 members, but we're trying to find volunteers. These are volunteers to go to Iraq. Think about this. Volunteers were ready to go over there and uh, fight. Volunteers were ready to go over there and, and uh, be mean and take lives and be shot at. Well, people do show up and volunteer for these things. I did. I called my friend. I said, hey, look, we either go this year with a group of 16 volunteers or we're going to end up going next year or the year after that with people who we don't know if they really want to go there. We, we're not sure. Why not? Why don't we sign up? Why don't we go as volunteers? And you know, at least as people that you know, they want to do this work. And he said, "Yeah, let's do it." So Dan, my buddy, and I, we we both, you know, called back and said, "Sign us up. We want to go to Iraq." So um, in January 2004, our flight lands in Kuwait after many hours of traveling from Washington State into Kuwait. In Kuwait, we have a lot more gruesome training happening, you know, live fire, desert operations. It was, um, again, tough and rough, but this is the, the military. I mean, what, what do you expect? Um, we finally load our convoy to go into Iraq on March 11th, 2004. I remember that feeling of uh, loading the first uh, round into my automatic weapon and knowing that the next time I would fire, it wasn't going to be training. The next time I fired that machine gun, I was going to kill somebody. And I was ready for it. I was excited. I was ready to go and harm people. I was ready to go and fight every Muslim who I believe was a terrorist. I was ready to fight every person in Iraq that I believe was supporting terrorism, that had killed all those people in New York. I was very angry, and I was very well trained, too. I had the capacity of let my anger go, release my anger in a violent way. And I was in Iraq. What a better place to be to do something like this. That's my whole team in Iraq. That's myself. And that's the job I had as a, the gunner of the rear vehicle uh, for, for our missions. I was, um, I was lucky. In part, I was very lucky. In Iraq, we had to leave our base about four or five times every week. And we would go to the different um, little towns that we had around our base. We're based in Tikrit, which is Saddam's home, hometown, uh, one of the nastiest areas to be in Iraq in, in those times. Uh, we would go to the little towns and talk to the local chief, the, the local boss, the, whoever was in charge of the area. And we would talk to them and see what they would need. And then we would go back later, like a week later or 10 days later, to take whatever they needed, school supplies, medical supplies, even money for construction. Um, the good part of us having interaction with Iraqis is I was able to talk to people. I was able to meet Iraqi people. I was able to find out what they felt about having troops over in their country. And I realized that I was very wrong. I was, uh, I was trained to hate. I was trained to do my job in the best way I could. And um, talking to people, I realized that Islam is not, is not a religion of hate. It's 
not a religion of terror. Uh, those people were, I would talk to the doctor, and the doctor wanted to be a doctor. He wanted to feed his kids. But, you know, the hospital was a bunch of rubble. Same thing happened with the school teacher. Same thing happened with any profession you had. Almost nobody had a job then. It's a country infested with soldiers with weapons. They taught me about their religion. They taught me how they, they, they want to love each other. They did not want to kill it. And they hadn't even thought about killing anybody. It's like if you go around Spain and you ask people about their weapons in their house, they're going to be like, what are you talking about? It was the same thing in Iraq. You know, they, they, they didn't want to kill people. They just wanted to continue with their lives. And um, it was rough. It was rough to admit, to accept that I was wrong, that I had been ready to, to go and, and, and hurt people uh, for what I believe was the right reason, but ended up being the wrong reason. Um, one thing that they did tell me is, you know, we, we don't want our kids playing outside in the playground with, uh, with armed men, armed people out here that are playing with our kids. And it's true, we would go to the towns and play with the kids. We'd play hide and seek or, you know, let's chase each other around. And, uh, and I always thought that, you know, when I went in, was, Iraqi people were so scary. It was so scary because you never knew who the terrorist was. And they were probably, most of them were terrorists. And probably most of them wanted to come and kill us. I was freaking out because they were scary. But who's the scary person here? That's, that's what it was. Children would come up to you, make you paper flowers. And they would play with you, and you would do all these different things with the children there. But we were still heavily armed at all times. Um, fortunately, by January 2005, a year later, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, March 11, 2004, uh, is not only the day I went into Iraq, it also happens to be the day the terrorist attacks happened here in Madrid. Several trains were blown up, about 200 people were killed. That night, I remember, we stopped our convoy in the middle of the desert because we hadn't made it to our first base. And uh, my buddy Dan said, uh, Sergeant Urbina, tomorrow when we get to base, you have to call your family because there have been several terrorist attacks. And, you know, they've killed 200 people. That my rage was like, <sighs> up to here. But I was lucky. I was very glad that I could meet people. I could talk to people and realize what this war was all about and that I was wrong. In uh, January 2005, I decided to go back to the States from Iraq. I don't decide. I'm able to go back to the States from Iraq. Um, and, and, you know, and I love the United States. I love the military. For me, it was an amazing experience. For me, it was great to have that camaraderie that I had with the people in the military. But the day I, I went back to the States, I knew that I could not be a soldier anymore. I could not be fighting anyone else's war. I could not be willing to kill people for, because someone else would tell me to go and fight someone's war. So I still love the country, but I, I can't, I, I'm not able to do that myself. I, I, my priorities changed. My, I made a change in my life and decided not to do those type of things. Um, I came back to Madrid. I, there was nothing that I wanted more than to come back to Madrid and be with my family and friends, the ones I grew up with. Um, I saw that death can come at any moment, and I know this sounds very tragic when you're very young. I was 23 when I was in Iraq. So, but this, this is how I felt. I felt you don't know when you're going to die. So if I do die, I want to be close to my family and friends. Um, August 2005, I was able to come back to Madrid. I found St. Louis University, which is another American university here in Madrid, and they accepted to take the few credits I had from college. Uh, they would take them in and then I could finish my bachelor's degree with them. And this time I didn't have to work. I would have like everything paid for by the military. And I was a, a veteran. So I, I, you know, these next couple years I studied. I got my bachelor's degree in international business. But the best thing that happened to me throughout these years was each summer I volunteered to go to Ethiopia with a group of teachers to teach English in the morning to a group of 400 kids. And then every afternoon we would spend 
uh, doing games, workshops, and uh, a lot of fun activities with, with a, a group of 300 girls uh, in the afternoons. It was an amazing time. I, I fell in love with Ethiopia the first time I went in the summer of 2006. So I continued to go 2007, 2008. And uh, so I went for several years and I was in love with what we did over there. And I'm, I'm still really in love with this project. Um, from there, I graduated from international business. Now I couldn't go to Ethiopia anymore in the summers because I didn't have the summers off. Now I had to work. I have to go into the real world and start working again. Um, my first job was, uh, was a job that everyone wants when you finish international business. I was hired to run the administration of a $43 million project in the Dominican Republic. We were building a windmill farm over there and I was running the administration for, all, for the whole project. And I was living in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> what is there not to like? Um, I had a job where I would wear a suit and a tie every day, I would dress nicely, I would do all the accounting, I would look into all the accounts, I would negotiate, um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was great, it was the job that everyone wants, it was, it was great, but I hated it, I hated that job, I didn't like working with numbers, I didn't like making money for another person in the company, I didn't like something that was so impersonal, where I spent most of the time in front of a computer you know, figuring out the numbers so that my bosses could get richer. Don't get me wrong, it was great to live in the Dominican Republic. I was living with people from all over the world, you know, and I was diving almost every weekend and, you know, during the week as well. So, but this job was just not, not for me. It wasn't what I liked it. I started to think maybe I studied the wrong thing. Maybe. So I changed. My company decided to move me from there and take me to Las Vegas. <laughs> Another great place to live, right? <laughs> well, no, I think Las Vegas is great for three, four days. And any more than that, it's really not that great. Um, but there I was doing the promotion of a, a thermal solar plant, the Renewable Energy, still with the same company. Um, this was a bit nicer because there weren't those many numbers involved. It was more about talking to people, talking to uh, political representatives, talking to the people in the energy business and uh, trying to get this project through. Um, so it was okay, it was still not what I was really happy with. And um, everything changed again with another phone call. This time the phone call came from my father. My father had been diagnosed not long ago with, um, with a skin cancer, it's a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And when they diagnosed, they said it was too late for him. So he was going to die. But they were going to try to make his life a bit longer with uh, chemotherapy. So he went through several different chemotherapies. And after the second one is when he called me. And he said, I quit. I want to die. I am sick. And this is making me sick. It's making me hurt. And he said, I just don't want to live anymore. So I didn't have the job I wanted. My father was dying. And I said, look, I need to be back with my family. The most important thing for me is my family, so I need to be back here. So I quit my job. I came to Madrid. And uh, for a while there, I wasn't doing anything. I was jobless, I was unemployed. I uh, was taking care of my dad. And my sisters also came from the different places where they were in the world. And uh, all the family was together. Um, I had a job as a bartender at a ski resort, which was fine. Um, and after the season was over, I decided that I, I again needed to get a job and you know do something for a living. So I, 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 did, I just didn't want to do anything, whatever came around. I said, okay, let me think what has made me the happiest. I've done a bunch of things in my life already at this point, so let me look back and see where have I truly been happy. And my mind would always take me back to Ethiopia, to those summers in Ethiopia. And I knew I wasn't gonna be able to live being a volunteer in Ethiopia because you don't make money being a volunteer. That's, that's why it's volunteering. Um, but I decided to focus into something where I could like organize volunteer work. I uh, tried to find a job in that field. And I sent a bunch of resumes here and there. Nothing came until a couple months after I started looking, I received an email from St. Louis University 
saying, hey, we have this opening. You know, the job is to coordinate volunteer work with Student Life here and to run the trip to Ethiopia every summer. What are the odds? None. <laughs> I said, yes, definitely, I'll take the job. So I started running the, the trip to Ethiopia. I, I was in charge of the trip for a couple of years. I would take a big group from 15 to 20 people over to Ethiopia every summer. Uh, I organize a lot of activities, like Camino Santiago, bike tours, very similar to what I do right now. Not only was I enjoying doing and organizing volunteer activities, uh, like I still do, but I, I found that I have a love and a passion for working with students. I have a passion for having students come from abroad to the country where I grew up and being able to show them a little bit of my culture, being able to guide them a little bit, you know, tell them where to go, uh, where to go get a haircut. Maybe go with you to the hospital if you need help one day. Uh, I don't know, many things that could happen and you need someone to be there with you and, and I love being that person and, and that's what I'm here for. So I discovered that, that you know, that, that I love working at a university, at a foreign university in student life. Um, I, I changed my job at St. Louis because I had this great offer here from NYU. I saw that they were looking for a manager of student life and I said, sure, I'll try out and, and I got the job. I was able to fool Rob into giving me the job. So I was, <laughs> and um, so in the end, yet another change comes and I come here to NYU. And uh, I still run the trip to Ethiopia every summer. I am just not able to go to Ethiopia because I don't have the vacations anymore. But I still set up the team. I work with the nuns that we go see over there. I work with the Ethiopian teachers that we work with. And it's... Uh, it was one of my passions. This is what I enjoy the most, organizing a team, sending them over there, and see them coming back all excited about what they've just done. Um, I also got married a year ago, which no one thought I would ever get married. And it's <laughs> probably the best decision I've ever made. I mean, I'm very happy about it. I still don't know how this happened. <laughs> and, and, and I love Nuria. I have a, a beautiful, charming wife that loves to travel with me, loves to do many things. Um, with me, all the, the crazy things I like to do, she's into them, so it's, it's very good. Um, to wrap this up a little bit, it's like, you know, why did you tell my other story? Uh, I know many of you might be wondering or might be a little bit afraid of what am I going to do in the future? Maybe some of you are thinking maybe this is not what I'm studying right now, is not what I should study. Uh, what's happened to all of us? Maybe not all of us, but a lot of us. Um, every I'm in a super happy moment in my life. I have a great job, I have a great wife, I have a lot of friends. And, um, but I, I made it here because of changes I've had and experiences I've had in the past. I probably would have never gone to Ethiopia if I didn't feel like I have to give something back to the world after being in Iraq. I probably would have never been to Iraq if I wasn't a screw up when I was a teenager and getting bad grades here in Madrid. So every change, everything I've done, I learned from. Some were better, some were worse. But there's a learning fact in every one of them. And you should make your decisions learning from these facts and you know, and thinking what step do you want to take next. Is this an ending for me in my career? Who knows, I have no idea. For now it is, I'm super happy here. So I, I hope I'll be here for a long time. But if a change comes, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. We'll take it when it comes. Thank you for listening. <laughs>